have you realized when all of your guests see you do this, they mimic you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> Welcome to Soul and Tonic, uh, where I am welcoming back one of my favorite guests, Brian Cochran. I feel hey, like he's got a jazzy name. It needs kind of a jazzy intro. Oh, wow. I've never heard that before. Jazz. Uh, speaking of smooth jazz. You haven't? Mm -mm. That's weird. Oh. I feel like you should hear that every day of your life. <laughs> 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 uh so uh as ryan aptly pointed out to me last time we jumped straight into a debate uh and uh, not between I, each other <laughs> no <laughs> discussing a debate between two other people and i uh completely failed as a host and uh forgot to to let ryan introduce himself yeah um uh, but it's Ryan, okay. who the hell are you <laughs> um so i am a complicated mixture of things um let's see i am a i guess evangelical because that is the you know thing that was handed down to me by my parents so hmm. um so that's what I'm born into. Um, I was actually born in Indiana, um, kind of Indianapolis area, and I grew up there uh, and stayed there till I was 20, uh, 21. And then I moved out. Um, land of corn. Yeah, land. Of, it really was. I, <laughs> my house was surrounded by soybeans and corn, depending on the year. I've um, driven through Indiana, and the only thing I saw for three hours was corn yeah yeah uh i actually kind of miss that um because i don't get that out here in the missouri kansas region um very much no so i don't um, know what we grow out here it's not corn uh, wheat i guess yeah um i don't know and sunflowers apparently Hey, those, those are great. I love sunflower fruit. I can't ever find them. I mean, like, I see a, a thousand photographers every oh, yeah. single year listening oh, yeah. about all the sunflower picks, and I can't find them. Yeah, I so. stumbled upon uh, some in a, a local park here in the Summit area um, once, and every year since then I've gone by to check it out, and they, they're not there, so... Uh, I'm kind of bummed about that because it was they were pretty awesome just huge tall sunflowers like hmm. yeah it, it's like cornfields but better <laughs> way more cheery and I would love a good cornfield <laughs> around here because I could get some really sick pictures with cornfields yeah yeah, yeah. I, could, I could imagine that yeah so, so All right. yeah, that, you I are an that. evangelical from Indiana from yeah. the land of the corn from the land of the corn um also the land of the ku klux klan apparently um <laughs> yeah uh, interesting that's where i thought i was from uh well uh so interesting thing about the town i lived in uh new palestine or new palestine depending on who you ask um uh, it was basically ku klux klan ran town um one of the I guess the dragon lived there. Um, in fact, can you guess what the mascot of my high school was? Mm. Hmm. A ghost? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so close. <laughs> it was a red dragon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think on multiple occasions, my father was asked to join the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> uh, they didn't call themselves that. Um, they right. had modernized and changed their name. Um, We're but... rebranding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, he wasn't into that, though, thankfully. So oh, I, I didn't grow up in uh, a super racist house just mildly <laughs> <laughs> no i'm just kidding uh but not really <laughs> uh, i think it was i think it was um 
you know, the kind of typical thing you think of, like just white people not being aware of um, their privilege. And I don't know, that's just what I grew up in. And probably everybody in that town was that way um, to some extent. And uh, yeah, I, I think I said around 21 years of age, I decided to move out um, and went out west to Kansas. Um, so I dropped what I was doing, uh, which was studying computer engineering mm. um, and picked up um, <laughs> go, going for. OK, so I will go from a school that is downtown in Indianapolis, in the city, you know, probably, I don't know, a million or so people to I went to a town that had 600 people in it. Like, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and the school was 200 of those 600 so a third of the town during the summer left yeah. um, on break so um, and that was a little tiny bible school called Barclay College mm. um, and they uh, light here. yeah a little hot on my face <laughs> sure <laughs> and they came, they came out of the uh, friends tradition or the Quakerism <laughs> oh, okay um, yeah so, uh, of course, they labeled their school as non-denominational, though. So, um, they were... Sorry, sound kind of, very similar to mine. Yeah. So, it was a little bit of a mixed bag of face, but um, denominations. But um, for the most part, you know, it was like my parents were Quakers and went to a Quaker church and, or friend's church and actually went to the school and, you know, probably oh, half, okay. half the school or more was like that um that's cool yeah so uh kind of some generational stuff going on there and i don't know sometimes that was a good thing sometimes not so much <laughs> <laughs> um but i really liked it out there um just because <clears throat> it was like kind of a little bit of a desert experience you know uh, just being out in the middle of nowhere in these fields where again you don't know what they grow but they grow something <laughs> i guess just Hot, hay, hay weed. No, no. um and uh yeah it was just a good place to just i don't know maybe make some mistakes and um and walking out what christianity is supposed to be like and um so it's kind of a sp safe space in that way and gave me a chance to explore um, what it means to be a Christian. Mm. Um, and really what that meant is I had to think critically or had the freedom to think critically about my faith and re-examine it. Um, so I kind of hit a, a rough patch by the end of just my first year there because um, it was like I was starting to go through de deconstruction already. Um, but a lot of things didn't start really tumbling down inside the labyrinth of my mind of what it means to be a Christian until probably my third year, my last year there. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think a lot of pieces, um, new pieces came along to say, Hey, maybe this fits in the puzzle instead of this. And, uh, I think that's kind of how deconstruction usually worked for me, um, is I wasn't really too ready to let go of things unless I had something else to replace it with. Um, oh, so, that's fair. Um, so sometimes it, it was holding on to something knowing this is broken, it doesn't work, and, but I don't know what to re replace it with. And so just, well, wait. And so, you know, sometimes it takes a few years of waiting to um, do study and research to find something that's fresh mm -hmm. and new. Um, and sometimes that just means finding something that's really old <laughs> and ancient. Um, so, yeah. Um, after that, I moved out uh, to Kansas City area where I met you. Kansas um, City. And my wife, and uh, we settled down here, and um, yeah, it's been pretty good six years of my life now here in the Kansas City area. So, good lord, yeah, has it been that long? I know, right? <laughs> Just fly <laughs> by. 
<laughs> no. <What>? Stop. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, I don't like that. Six years. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So. But um, yeah. That that's a little bit of me. Um, there's probably a lot more to it than that. Uh, like I really love board games. I really love Star Wars. I really love. Uh, well, obviously, theology, kind of philosophy, spirituality, uh, spiritual formation is kind of a, a big thing I'm really digging into and trying to figure out like uh, the puzzle pieces of that and what it looks like. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, like it's been an adventure just um, both in um, kind of reassembling my faith through after deconstruction and and then building a new life here in Kansas City area at the same time so yeah hmm. so yeah oh huh. thank you for sharing yeah no problem though I uh, must say I'm a little amiss by your not adding uh, old Tolkien era songs to that list uh, of yeah. interests yeah i mean you got star wars good job uh, <laughs> you didn't say twilight imperium what the hell i, I mean uh, it's implied when i say board games let's uh, let's be honest that game transcends board games. <laughs> it's not a board kidding? game anymore <laughs> it is a space odyssey it is uh, glorious <laughs> yeah the the space operas of space opera of space operas it's it's good um, a good 11 hours yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh all right so last time you were on the show we had a discussion concerning a debate that we uh came across on youtube uh so this time we're doing something a little different uh we're gonna be oh, yeah. talking about uh, just some different topic matters uh concerning christianity and spirituality and uh I think today's topic is uh, a humdinger, <laughs> as they might say. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, so today we're talking a little bit about the uh, dichotomy between uh, faith and works. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be talking about the false dichotomy of, <laughs> between faith and works. Um, now, I, I, I think we probably need to lay out a few um foundational definitions of what we're talking about so ryan would you like to kind of define for us what we mean when we're saying faith and works i would but i'd actually like to hear from you i'm gonna i'm gonna up your question with another question uh <laughs> dog gun so what <laughs> what's the kind of typical thing you've heard from this kind of uh, debate of faith and works and how they define the two in your own faith tradition oh shoot uh, my current faith tradition or the one I grew up in because oh, both. very different right now okay yeah I'd like to hear both <laughs> yeah uh, so if I if just off the bat let's, uh, if we just uh, dive back a couple decades to small city in Tennessee uh, the, uh, the the real thing about faith and works which ended up being a real topic in college later on um, was the uh, it's kind of a mixed bag <laughs> it was mm. really kind of a, an ongoing thing of uh, the salvation is by faith alone faith in Christ alone um, and not by works so there's this whole uh, you couldn't earn your way into heaven. Uh, mm -hmm. There wasn't enough things that you could do to get right. You uh, you had to accept Jesus into your heart. You need to, to pray the prayer uh, and repent of your sins. And, uh, and that was the way to heaven. You couldn't do enough good to outweigh the evil that you were doing. Okay. Um, and in to some degree, uh, there was a, an element of you. it's not possible to do anything good. Because if you're not in Christ, everything you're doing is most likely in some way, shape, or form selfish or malicious. 
yeah. uh, which is a perspective and <laughs> <laughs> uh and so that was it was kind of that setup where it was like okay it's it's you know that um which is which is a lot of what my professors taught as well uh kind of a emphasis on faith alone you gotta mm. you can't give in to the the lie that it's you know you can earn your way to heaven but uh what was interesting is that even though like my uh, I think my professors didn't get it right. I think what they were able to point out to me was the tradition that I grew up in was uh, often very disconnected uh, with what they were saying versus what they were doing. And so uh, even though there was this uh, emphasis on faith, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Pentecostal church, but there's a lot of emphasis on faith. Um, but the way that uh, it works out practically didn't always manifest that way. There was still an element of, well, what are you doing? You know, like, oh, things are going bad. What are you doing? You're not doing enough prayer. You're not doing enough reading your Bible. You're probably not speaking in tongues enough. Um, all these other things, which is, I don't know. I mean, uh, even though it's it was more of an element of, well, God's mad at you. I mean, there's kind of the questions like, can you really separate how God feels about you from salvation? I mean, if you're in the wrong standing with God, or God's angry with you, or bringing something upon you, like, what does that what does that mean for salvation? So there's a there's a lot of murky waters there uh, in the in that in that that end of the theological pool. Um, but now. Yeah now uh i have uh <laughs> unlike you I, I do not identify as a evangelical anymore uh on my i think on my facebook i actually have it as post evangelical uh <laughs> as my i like that yeah. Faith. yeah uh which is is kind of a uh what oh <sighs> rachel held evans was i think the one who coined that term or at least she okay she kind of made it a, a bigger deal uh fun fact her father was a professor at my school uh, oh. at a, uh, a little town in dayton tennessee um but uh which caused a lot of stir but we're not getting into that <laughs> uh and, and so since then uh you know i've done a bit of exploring and in my own experience with deconstruction i i have a tendency to to let go of things very slowly it takes a long time for me to change my position on something because uh I, i'd rather have a good reason to like i want to be mm, certain yeah. before i jump on something so uh so with a lot of my friends they uh they ventured over into uh, anglicanism pretty early on and uh, out of college um, and I didn't follow as quickly because I was like, I don't want to be a bandwagon guy. I don't want to be someone who's just like <laughs> following with everybody else. I want to know that like, if I'm going to do this, I'm doing it for myself. <laughs> and they got so frustrated with me, uh, thinking I was extremely stubborn. And I'm just like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not just going to jump ship. So, um, but eventually I did, I did go with Anglicanism as the primary theological community that I uh, identified with. And since then, you know, we went through Shelterwood. We've <laughs> gone through uh, oh, we've gone through a therapeutic boarding school with a generic name that <laughs> I don't know if it really matters if I say the name or not. Uh, but the the that whole experience of working in a, a therapeutic environment that just changed the way that I viewed things because I was in a place where uh, I thought I was doing what I was called to do and mm -hmm. and then I had to leave it for my own health and and from that feeling like a failure and that was feeling like I had completely let down God and so that that actually stirred um, the whole topic of faith and works for me again okay. where I was beginning to wonder, like, maybe I was finding my fulfillment in God and feeling and fulfillment in, um, in play, like, you know, uh, 
by by finding it in this calling that I have objectified that I have a purpose and a thing I need to be doing for God to be happy with me and thus everything else is kind of tied with that you know so uh, by extension but since then I've I've ventured into Eastern Orthodoxy a lot of Antiochian Orthodox and uh, done a lot of deconstruction a lot of questioning of my faith and so there's this whole shift in not only how I view faith and works but also how I view the gospel because for the most part what I what I learned from an um, upbringing that I had was that you needed to do a prayer you need to accept Christ you need to repent and that was the gospel you're a dirty sinner Christ came to die for you so that you could say a prayer repent of your sins and thus be saved and since then, having taken on a more orthodox view of the, the gospel being a healing of the cosmos, a ongoing healing process, a mm -hmm. uh, regenerative process uh, in, a, in a different way than what I grew up in, makes a huge difference. And for me, I believe that a part of that is works and faith being combined together. Uh, I've heard of uh, some people, even in some of the traditions, this concept of growing your soul, uh, which is a, it's a term that uh, re resonates with me, but I don't think is exactly what is going on with me. It's, it's a process of the, the whole working out your own salvation uh, with mm -hmm. fear and trembling is more than just being afraid and shaking but also you are doing stuff to mature yourself you're disciplining yourself you're growing internally through your external actions and then mm. and the way that you are acting is out of faith and and that kind of uh is how i could best describe what is my current perspective on it as i seek to become a spiritually mature person a spiritually healthy person which is not just my craving and desire for heaven which i have also done a lot of theological work in what heaven is but in terms of my my here and my now the two are together because through what i do i can build myself up or tear myself down and that impacts me spiritually and so my faith practice the practice of doing liturgy, doing prayers, uh, uh, these ritualistic things out of symbolism and belief and intentionality are growing me. And I, mm -hmm. I believe it was C.S. Lewis that said, he's like, I don't pray because it changes God. I pray because it changes me. Yeah. And that is my perspective of like me working out my salvation, me doing liturgy, literally translates to work the work of the people me liturgizing my life to be intentional has a huge impact on my soul mm -hmm. which i believe is a part of this whole process of salvation so yeah, yeah. oh does that, that make sense yeah yeah i really especially like the part that you said like what i do like changes me on the inside like yeah. I'm actually going to take that fold it up <laughs> save that for later and we're going to we're going to see that little we're going to come back to that <laughs> okay. save that for later <laughs> but yeah and, and you know what you kind of described with um, kind of the old way of seeing things in your old tradition, um, how you were taught. Uh, that sounds very similar to all the things I was taught. Um, and certainly by some professors as well. Um, yeah. um, honestly, I'm not sure where I got the notion to start challenging that little piece of like faith and works and stuff. Um, because I think I did wholesale pretty much buy into, oh yeah, faith is where it's at. Works suck. 
<laughs> um, so <laughs> here we are today, though, and we're talking about the false dichotomy of faith and works. Um, so I, I want to get into that, but I think there's one more thing we have to unpack. And thank you oh. for unpacking all of that, by the way. <laughs> um, but also, let's unpack what's the difference between belief and faith? Because I think mm -hmm. that may be important to the conversation. Is there a difference? Is it the same thing? That's a good question. Uh, well, if we, what we know about faith is like the evidence of things hoped for. Mm -hmm. uh, or the evidence, you know, the like the evidence of things unseen. Yeah, kind of a overall, still a very vague definition. Um, yeah, though, I recently heard this argument about the difference between faith and belief, as uh, the faith kind of a, a letting go, and like you kind of accept things as they are. And believe is more of a, oh, I really want it to be this. Or kind of a, I don't know, what, how do you, they, they sound very similar, but I think there's some really subtle differences between the two. Yeah. So, um, but I, I think um, maybe in the old kind of way of looking things for me, um, the tradition would just say they're the same, right? Um, yeah. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure they're the same, um, especially when they're used very differently within Scripture. Um, so that's where I want to get into this. All right, let's start there. Um, so belief and faith. Um, hmm. Well, they don't seem to be the same because uh, they're never used in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, faith is generally used when talking about something that people are doing. They're mm -hmm. doing something. Abraham, you know, he was, he was saved by faith, right? Um, it was his faith that saved him, but he didn't know where he was going. And yet he did it anyways. Um, hmm. And then there's a lot of accounts like that. In fact, I think most of um, the stories of the Old Testament are, are just that. Um, stories of people doing things despite really knowing what's going to happen. Or, or having um, really an idea of where they're going or something like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the, the conversation I think is gonna, um, obviously end up with, uh, you know, we're gonna end up in the, the passage of James, uh, with faith without works is dead, right? Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at... Um, Hebrews 11, 1. Okay. <clears throat> so, Hebrews 11, 1. A lot of translations will read like this. It says, Faith is the assurance or confidence mm -hmm. of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mm. So assurance confidence conviction if you were to talk about where faith is in within your own living self and everything from thinking to doing where is that where's that happening assurance mm -hmm. confidence conviction it sounds like it's happening in the head like it's happening within yeah. That's NIV, ESV, uh, NASV. Um, but let's take a look at some other translations. 
Faith is the substance or reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That, I think, has a little bit of a different connotation. It sounds yeah. actually more external. Yeah, um, much more physical, much more tangible. Yeah. Reality. <laughs> uh, evidence. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, in, in Scripture, faith always seems to be connected with doing something. And then this translation is kind of kind of suggests that it is something about reality something evidenced something external not just something we think about um why is there a difference though hmm. well it it's not that one is wrong and the other is right necessarily be um as far as just translating greek goes but in the context of what the writer is talking about, most people throughout time of Christianity have agreed actually that second version is what the, the translation should be. Mm. Um, so, you know, technically the Greek holds kind of both a little bit. Um, it's it's just unclear to translate Greek to another language, any language to another language in the first place. So that's yeah. that's just the battle of translating. I mean, there's never a one to one word that mm. fits. Yeah. Um, hardly ever. So, um, so the second one seems to be what um, ancient Christians um, have really thought is the way of understanding Hebrews um, so if we if we think about faith as something we do some kind of reality of things mm -hmm. hoped for and it gives evidence of something unseen then what is the unseen thing it's talking about as well all right mm -hmm. so this is this is kind of the idea that I'm trying to get at is um, uh, belief and faith aren't the same thing, and then actually faith and works are not something you just do together. They're literally the same thing. <laughs> when when I'm breaking out what you're putting down. <laughs> yeah, so it's not just a false dichotomy because like oh you're supposed to do both of these things. It's no, when scripture talks about faith, it's saying your works. That's why James is saying faith without works is dead. It's like, it's ridiculous to say you have faith, but I have works. And it's like, what is, he's like, what, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> I mean, so what, what, why even is he led to write a piece like this? It's because Paul is going around to these Gentile people groups and he's teaching them the gospel and what it means. Uh, what does salvation mean? And he's probably teaching them in Greek. And so there's some confusion hmm. between this faith that's just like this internal thing and this faith that's an external thing. And so... Um, James is doing damage control. Mm. He's he's responding to something um, where people are saying this. Uh, that's why he's quoting people. Uh, let's see. Um, what what good is it, my brother, is if someone says his, he has faith but does not have lyrics? Uh, can that faith save him? Man can it i think that's a little rhetorical <laughs> um if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you say says to them go in peace be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body what good is that so also faith by itself 
if it does not have works, is dead. As in, the works is part of the faith. I mean, it's the one and the same. So, where does that leave us when we've been taught like our whole life in our evangelical faith that you need to think about Jesus and accept him and boom, presto, you're in. Yeah, baby. But, uh, but, oh. but you brought up something about your faith tradition. Yeah. That was saying the opposite, almost. While saying, you know, faith is the only way, as in this internal thing that you accept Christ. Yeah. So even there, there was some cognitive dissonance, right? Yeah. We keep throwing this word around, or phrase around, I should say, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> it's, <so> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really one of my favorite phrases now. <laughs> yeah. I've nearly put it into three emails just today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh um, <laughs> so uh, there, there's some realization even within these traditions uh, that we're talking about um, that we kind of grew up in that you, you need works um, you still need the change and so um, what, what what drives that in the first place that they would say it's just an internal thing should we just throw all that out should we say oh um the kind of internal <clears throat> battle of accepting christ and all that doesn't really matter it's just about works which is it really faith is that what i'm trying to say just just do good and i'll save you no that's that's not what i'm trying to say yeah and that's where i pull this little guy out <laughs> and like <laughs> <laughs> I think the point is it transforms you. Yeah. Yeah. I think spiritual formation is done through doing something. Um, but that is not to dis discount, you know, intellectual pursuit. It's not mm -hmm. to say uh, theology doesn't matter. It's not to say... Um, you know, these uh, uh, practices of prayer, of meditation, of fasting, none of that matters. It's just about like doing good works for the poor or something like that. Um, uh, so there is a more holistic model, I think. Mm. And I think um, the problem we run into is look, James, John, Peter, Paul, they didn't all sit down together and like kind of pound this all out in some really systematized, solid structure of theology and just hand it to us. They give us kind of like pieces here and there to assemble on our own. And really they gave us pieces just when we were missing them. And when I say we, not really we, <laughs> people from long ago. <laughs> Uh, so this is one example of, you know, him trying to just slot a little piece at these uh, probably Greek speaking uh, cultures, people of new faith, new, new um, acceptance into the body of Christ um, are kind of missing. Um, so what does that look like in a holistic fashion? And I think um, I want to go um, with there is something to uh, th like thinking on something, uh, knowing something. Um, and um, that is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. But you don't have belief. You don't have faith. Um. So I want to start there because that's a lot of times how we come to new realizations of, of uh, faith traditions, of theology, of <laughs> deconstruction, 
it's probably a lot of times started through some new thought bomb dropped on you that you're like i had no idea you know right yeah and it kind of disrupts you uh shakes you up um so we start there but we have no real um idea of why it matters until we act it out Mm -hmm. and so that's where the faith comes in right we've never really seen it work in our life we don't know where we're going really so we have to just live it out and see for ourselves and experience it Mm -hmm. experience god there's a difference between knowing him and experiencing him Mm -hmm. and so um so to stop there at knowing is Gnosticism. That's the very thing the church was battling so hard yeah. at the very beginning. And this is the start of it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, with the church saying, oh, I, I have faith. We're good. You know, that's the Gnostic thought. And then it, it gets murky and dangerous because that just yeah. keeps growing. Because it's yeah. like, okay, well... Do you know Christ rightly? Yeah. yeah. Do you know the correct way to say the prayer? Do you know the mm-hmm. Do you know the correct Bible? <laughs> yeah. Are you reading yeah. the King James? <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you're not talking about people two thousand years ago. <laughs> no. <laughs> so <laughs> no, a Gnosticism like is alive and well. Yeah. Uh, within the American Church, for certain, um, probably. In churches all over the world um so yeah, and it, it, i would it, agree with that because i think that the west has really botched this yeah and we uh kind of colonialized christianity and kind yeah. of took this throughout the world so we've impacted global christianity through these uh beliefs and through these theological doctrines and I mean, we can really pinpoint it back to Luther, who I think was pendulum swinging pretty hard. Um, yeah, that reaction to the the Catholic Church, who I feel may have taken it a little too far yeah. with indulgences and different practices to try and earn your way out of purgatory. And he was reacting to a lot of that. I bet, but he was going way too far. I mean, like he wanted James to be completely removed from the Bible right. altogether, from what I understand. It's like a book of straw, I think he called it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I wanted to throw it, it on the fire. It, it just makes sense that there isn't a full understanding, but I think this also just speaks to how even people back then got confused over Paul. I mean, some of his letters are him trying to clarify himself from his previous letters. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the like guy didn't yeah. fully yeah. make sense with everything he said. And yet, it seems like the traditions that we're surrounded by want to kind of put Paul up pretty darn close to Christ in terms of theological importance and his words mm-hmm. being, you know, substantial to the life of the believer. So, maybe not do that. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I get that. I think that's where a lot of people really struggle and why most people want to ignore James because they see that shift, right? There's that move from talking about uh, salvation um, comes through faith, not by works, um, by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. So when we're taught over and over and over again. People just kind of brush over James, and so it feels inferior to this stuff that we're being told repeatedly. Learn this, memorize this, recognize Paul. And so when the two come together, people just kind of let Paul completely override James because they don't see it as being equally important uh, or even having like the same substance, even though they were literally in the same position of authority. Um, as apostles, though uh, some of the Orthodox might suggest that he may have been higher than him. 
uh, as there is some theological questions about whether James wasn't actually the the first among equals in terms yeah. of like the apostles um, <clears throat> in authority. But that's neither here nor there. What we have is people completely negating that because of Paul. So how do we take that scripture from Paul and and, and turn and say, okay, these are the same thing? Because Paul seems to be breaking it apart where he says... Uh, uh, salvation is by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. Yeah. So is uh, so. I guess in my mind, and how I've worked it out with theology and exploring theological thought, is that he's probably not talking necessarily about the same thing. Uh, our translation says works, lest any man should boast. But really, uh, if we are to understand faith, which I do believe. Paul would even attest to what faith is and uh, would affirm that faith is, you know, true religion, true faith, helping the widow and the orphan, doing these things. Faith is action out of a confidence of belief, of an internal thing. While <clears throat> works in this instance isn't referring to like it's not negating action it's not saying that um faith is non-action and that salvation has nothing to do with action at all but merely it's not a collection of these things that you can do to you know build yourself up or to to earn your way in this is where salvation is it's through mm -hmm. uh, by grace given freely through faith the grace comes through faith but even that's just our constant living out what we believe not by works that we can just go and do whatever we want call it good or like you know hope that it's good enough there's there's something there i think but i think it's kind of confusing language as is a lot of the bible yeah and i think that that's where we start to, to break it down as a, a culture and separating the two. And I think there's probably some influence from the Enlightenment age where a lot of it was about thought. Uh, your, your, you know, the trying to rationalize the world. Uh, so there's, there's definitely some reactionary stuff going on there because I know a lot of the stuff that I heard in terms of growing up, a lot of the, the reaction against you know, earning your salvation was often coupled with negative comments about the Catholic Church. It's like, oh, those, you know, they're over there earning their salvation with their weekly mass. Yeah. And doing all their uh, Eucharist and stuff. And <laughs> Eucharist. <now. laughs> uh, but, but they would call them having dead religion. They would say that they have a dead religion. And we're not about religion, we're about relationship. Mm. But it was it was lacking a lot of the the, the wonderful <laughs> transformative actions. It lacked depth of prayer, and it, and there were these things that uh, were missing. And people began to stray theologically. Okay, and yeah. Let, so yeah, I think that all that comes together. All of like, yeah, because if you don't, you're just gonna you're gonna create something else altogether. All right, so let's continue in uh, the little model I'm kind of portraying here. Um, and I think that it'll answer a lot of your questions, actually. Uh, so we're starting in with the thinking, right? Yep. And we're moving on into faith. It's uh, kind of going on in the process. Next stop, faith. And um, certainly it seems like Paul is um, saying, well, faith is something else not works from that comparison when we just kind of just breeze through it um mm -hmm. but I, I think it's very important to realize he says uh grace through faith one thing and then uh works another thing mm -hmm. those are the two things he's comparing yeah. grace and faith and works not faith and works Mm -hmm. now even then if he did compare the two I think he'd still say there's a difference uh, because faith does imply more than just works 
it, it implies that you are doing something despite what you believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so, um, but also let's focus on the word through. Let's not pass over that too quickly. Mm-hmm. It's grace through faith. Or, um, mm-hmm. let's, let's sub it out for, you know, let's say grace through works. You know, because works is kind of a part of faith. So the action of it. Um, so let's restate it as grace through living out your faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is that implying? It's not the final destination. There's something beyond faith. Mm-hmm. It's something you, it's like passing through the waters and there's something on the other side, a promised land. Mm-hmm. And um, so what is that? And I think that's where belief comes in. So you start off actually thinking something, choosing to act despite what you believe. Hmm. Through action, you experience God's goodness. His, mm-hmm. You actually experience his grace. And then you change your belief. And if we really go through kind of what that means, it means you're moving from the head down to the heart. You're moving from the head of just kind of actively knowing things to now it's like a subconscious thing. It's mm-hmm. it's a deep part of you. Mm-hmm. And that, that's yeah. where spiritual transformation is really happening. It's and not I, about I think that, just doing things. I think another way that I would look at it, another way that I might define it, just listening to that, is that uh, it's more through the the active life, the the active pursuit, and not through one's own successes. So, like the like actively pursuing to live out my faith and to to engage in the world and, and, and to grow with Christ and grow my understanding of truth and knowledge and, and my uh, spirituality and my spiritual life versus a collection of things that I've completed, a collection yeah. of checklists. Because one is much more you know, active in a way and the other one is more like a list of completion. Because when you think about by your works, like, oh, I've done this, 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 and this, you know? While my faith is like a constant, living, breathing thing that is passively a part of my life. It's the way that I'm living, the way I'm treating people. It's uh, me making hard decisions, me engaging with the world, and and not just making a a checklist of everything I've done or collecting up everything I've done. So I think that's where I I think that I I see a, a difference between the two, that the active pursuit of being creative versus I have completed this many pictures, you know, things yeah. like that. If I were to make an active comparison. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what you said about uh, faith is something that is, is happening continuously mm-hmm. throughout your life. Right. Um, every day continuously. Well, that's also true of thinking and belief. Mm-hmm. And so um, I want to complete the loop because I think it is a loop. Your, your belief does come back and inform your thinking. And in fact, that, that's actually the problem we find ourselves is we are in this spiral, this perpetual motion machine of, mm-hmm. of really self-oriented thinking, behavior, and belief. And we're just stuck in it. And the reason why Paul says grace is so important, that it's grace through faith, is because grace enters from outside of us. It's an external force that disrupts the machine and reorients it and makes it work in our favor instead of against us. Mm -hmm. And so now we've reoriented ourselves. Now we're others-oriented. 
and it's, it, it's the same machine, but it's totally changed. <laughs> you know, so that that's that's salvation. That mm -hmm. I mean, now all of a sudden everything's changed for you, um, both in this life and the next. If there's a next life, then we can have that. Some other person smarter than me can have that argument. So. <laughs> <clears throat> It's not a topic I want to get into. <laughs> but, mm. um, yeah, so I, I thought this might be an important subject for some people um, because of how we've pitted these two things against each other of mm -hmm. like inner belief slash faith or, and um, what I do in my life. Um, and it's just a false dichotomy and um and and it totally leaves out like a third wheel you know uh third piece of the puzzle and so uh, you can never assemble it if you don't understand all the pieces and so you got to really redefine and when i say redefine go back to the original definitions of these words yeah. and really really see the pattern that we're describing and if if you want examples of how thinking matters and um and why it's part of the system that i'm drawing out mm -hmm. as part of the loop and where this it's the starting point i mean just look at jesus what okay let me ask you this what is the gospel you're probably gonna give me a long answer i'm gonna try and keep it as concise as possible <clears throat> uh uh Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Yeah. The Apostles' Creed is the the, the quintessential of the gospel, <clears throat> um, in my opinion. Okay. And sitting through a communion service is probably the most concise gospel presentation one can mm. get. Yeah. So, I don't think you're wrong, but that's not what Jesus would say. Mm. He would say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is here mm. and so uh let's start let's just start with that word repent i mean what's it mean it's it's a loaded word it it belongs in this conversation of what does faith mean what does belief mean because the first one is repent mm -hmm. and it's about thinking it's about changing your way of thinking it mm -hmm. means to turn around and go the other direction but it implies not thinking a, a simple one time thing like that is a continual process so it's really just like a, a continuation of learning and changing your mind or like reassessing your thought processes or your actions and saying no i should not be doing this or no maybe i should be doing this and continuing along the path that's a, con a continual addressing of oneself right um maybe yeah maybe it it's hard to say what he meant by that um i mean to say change your way of thinking and go in a, the opposite direction is pretty pretty stark contrast um and it kind of feels like a one-time thing because all of a sudden when you're fake going in the opposite direction it's it's gonna set you in a very different endpoint, and um but with the rest of the sentence, it is uh, it is getting back to living and how you live your life because it's saying that the kingdom of heaven is here. To unpack that, it really just boils down to like, well, there's a lot to it. But So I am going to oversimplify this quite a bit. Uh, so if you're listening and your theology major, don't don't quote me on this because, <laughs> um your professors may you cru like crucify so me a single podcast episode right <laughs> but um basically it means change your way of thinking for a new way of living is here mm -hmm. um and, and that's what i'm trying to describe as this new way of living um is mm -hmm. grace enters into our world into our reality and um it wants us to experience it uh, yeah. and so we don't have a whole lot <laughs> of idea where it's gonna take us yet 
we choose to act on it and we see from our own life from our own experience of it in our life that yeah. it's worth it okay. and so it reorients us mm-hmm. within and so we continue on that path mm-hmm. of not being self-oriented but being others oriented mm-hmm. so yeah what do you think about that i think that's beautiful and i think that that sounds like uh, uh faith sounds like me lighting incense and mm. uh chanting out a little prayer and mm. uh it sounds like going to church not just to say that i've done it or to make an appearance but also to to actively seek and pursue my relationship with god and with others and it, it makes me think of uh something that my pastor once told me that really resonated with me that there is no greater endeavor for a person to take on than to pursue the salvation of their own soul and the the activeness of what he was saying um the 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 chasing after and the intentionality and pursuit and uh living out faith really stuck with me and and that is part of the reason why i found myself in this place of the two are not separated that they go hand in hand and yeah now uh uh, thanks to some of this dialogue more of seeing it as being the same thing as being the way that we live out our lives and not just being a matter of thought not just a gnostic thing but a a continual daily living thing and yeah 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 this was a good conversation okay yeah. <laughs> yeah i thought so too so yeah. uh yeah i feel challenged uh and and i always appreciate that uh being able to be challenged by you because it's just taking things i've been working out and, and thinking through and things that i've I've been developing and then helping yeah. to refine that a little bit. And so yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and honestly, um, it's a learning experience for me too. Um, I think the challenge of communicating this and teaching it actually helps me as well. Chris, as Christo says, when you teach a student, you teach two people. There's when there's a teacher teaching, there's, two students always Mm. you know so i'm the student as well um so you know by me communicating this i'm solidifying it within my own mind of Mm. how i need to act on it and then therefore through action believe on it Mm. Uh, so but yeah i think i think uh yeah we got we gotta separate this idea of um of faith and and belief uh certainly and and differentiate that from thinking because um man i I think so much of our society um just ignores what's going on within and uh with our feelings and our heart and um and that's that's what belief i think is really all about it it affects you down in your feelings Hmm. Um, you you move from the intellectual um, into the action, and, and that yeah. then affects you at your feelings. Uh, so, um, mm. yeah, yeah, and uh, that sounds that sounds yeah. You said it beautiful to me, and uh, so yeah. I hope. Uh, I hope for anybody listening um, that no matter what faith tradition you're in, you can take a piece of this and, and uh, kind of run with it. Um, I think with just this little understanding of how spiritual formation works within you, um, through you, uh, through your external actions and what's going on in you. Um, 
you will experience transformation um, no matter what your walk is, is looking like. No matter what your, well, I shouldn't say no matter what your theology is, I guess, but I mean, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think God will honor it um, uh, because how we're saved is through his grace not through your theology so um, yeah I think when when we ex experience grace we want to become grace um, and when we experience love we want to become love hmm. so. yeah that is beautiful and uh, I think that is the best place for us to end this conversation. That is uh, an excellent ending point. Ryan, thank you so much for being on here and sharing your thoughts. If you like this conversation and want to engage in further conversations in the future, please hit like and subscribe. Ring that little bell at the bottom. And uh, you know, leave us comments. Share your thoughts on what we talked about today anything that you would like for us to talk about in the future and uh you know just you know how you're doing today that'd be great i want to hear how you're doing uh in the meantime uh remember that life is short and there is very little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us so be quick to love and make haste to be kind and until next time this is soul and tonic bye <laughs>